Come on, have a seat. That's the David Mulligan who's going to have an invitation for us. <laughs> I'm going to pray a prayer for our country, and then in particular I ask the Lord's blessing on the Marshfield Fire Department. And I don't think that we can be uh, overly thankful for the, the service that they provided over the last 100 years. It's incredible work and I just I'm thankful that the Lord give people that kind of a heart that they would be dedicated to the to the fire department. So if we could bow our heads please. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogancy, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And be with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in need to fail. And in particular, O oh Lord, we ask your blessing upon the Marshfield Fire Department, and on the celebration of their centennial, we pray that you would continue to protect them, grant them safety, and a very dangerous task that they perform. And we also pray your blessing upon this day and all its activities. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So we're going to have to select forward to uh, safety and this morning. Um, on behalf of the select board, I'd like to welcome everybody to the centennial celebration of the fire department. Um, as you can see, the fire department has done a great job organizing the centennial celebration. They've done all the organizing, put everything together for everybody here. They've done a great job. So a good fortune we have to live in a community where so many people give so freely of their time volunteering in all manners of activities. Nowhere in Marshfield is this spirit better exemplified than within the fire department. The accurate membership of the fire department prior to 1940 is elusive, but over the past 70 years, more than 200 individuals have served. 
Several members have served for 40 years or more. Many others have put in 25 years or more. And more commonly, 10, 15, and 20 years. Six of our seven fire chiefs that we have records of are currently still with us. Um, Hap Hayward, Ronald Pitkin, Johnny Schmidt, Dwight Baker, Tom McClay, and the current fire chief, Tom McClay II. Ted Clark is the uh, the only fire chief that we have record of that is no longer with us. Um, it's comforting to know that within just minutes of being called to a fire or car accident, these dedicated professional men and women will arrive to rescue us or our loved ones or to protect our property without a second thought of their own peril. What we often don't see are the continuous activities of training, equipment maintenance, regular meetings, training, endless paperwork, and training, which are all essential elements of operating modern-day fire department. We also, nor do we see the instantly interrupted family meals, birthday parties, holidays, or weekends. We are gratefully, grateful not only to be part only to the firemen, but to their families as well. Let us not forget who responds without hesitation in the middle of those cold, wintry nights when, for some reason, many car accidents and chimney fires seem to occur. For all, for all of this, we give our thanks and appreciation to the fire department and the many volunteers on the Marshfield Fire Department. Let's hope that the next 100 years will see a level of local dedication as great as the first 100 years. Thank you. There will be a resolution introduced in the uh, House and Senate this January, and there are Bill Dale and Dan Ansel are here to read us what that resolution will be saying. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Representative Mansell and I are most honored to be here on this most important occasion. It's in 1830. And Frenchman named Alexis de Tocqueville came to America and he said the difference between Europe and America is a volunteer sport, volunteer spirit in this nation and certainly nothing symbolizes volunteerism better than uh, a fire department. So we're here to read and I will share the resolution. It was introduced by Representative Ansel and by Senator Doyle, Cummings and Scott. Uh, the Senate concurrent resolution commemorating a century of outstanding community-based volunteer firefighting service in the town of Marshfield. Uh, whereas in 1909, the voters of Marshfield recognized the need for improved fire protection, and a special town meeting was called to seek approval for the acquisition of a locally-based firefighting equipment. And whereas the town soon purchased a hand pump and horse track and, de and designated a storage place for this new equipment. Originally, three decades later, in 1937, Marshfield citizens decided to update and expand the scope of the town's firefighting service, voting to purchase the first motorized truck and Chevrolet pumper and to build a fire station. And whereas the organizational structure of the firefighting service was formalized as a volunteer fire department in 1961, and where the department finally retired the faithful Chevrolet and replaced it with a 1964 maximum 1,000 gallons per minute. That at that time was the largest water pumper in the area, and I know there's a photograph of that in the back. 
whereas the Marshfield Fire Department volunteer was an original signer of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System Agreement. And now at this point, I'll turn the other part of the resolution over to Representative Ansel. Thank you very much. So I'll read the rest of the resolution. Uh, whereas the ability to communicate with and offer support to neighboring fire departments was greatly improved when in 1967 the department invested in portable radios. And whereas the town of Marshfield established 911 emergency response capacity well before the statewide E911 network became operational. And whereas in recent years the Marshfield Volunteer Fire Department has continued to improve the quality of service it offers the community, and among the upgrades was the designation of the firehouse as a local emergency operations center. And whereas, on October 10, 2009, today, the Marshfield Volunteer Fire Department proudly marks the century of serving its neighbors with a bagpiper-led procession of old fire equipment, including the original 1910 hose cart, going from the fire station to the old school has common, where many celebratory and recognition events are taking place. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives that the General Assembly is pleased to commemorate a century of outstanding community-based volunteer firefighting service in the town of Marshfield, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State will be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the Marshfield Volunteer Fire Department and the Marshfield Town Fire Congratulations, everybody. Next, I have uh, Chief Tim McClough. This is going to feel like a stuff shirt. I have several thank yous that I need to inquire with. Well, first of all, Tim Morris, who has spent almost a year in collecting all the information we have on the back table and putting this whole day together for everybody to enjoy. Um, Meg Everhart, she's, she transferred a lot of the photos and videos on the format so you can see them on the computer room. Uh, Larry Brown did a lot of the printing for us. Uh, Alan Taplo is videotaping this event for us today. Rachel Brandt for making the signs that we put up. Jacob and the Boy Scout for the TA system and the pictures that she's taken today. Our bagpipers, Timothy Morris and Ian McCarty, I really want to thank you very much. I appreciate this very much. I love bagpipers. Uh, the Plainfield and Walden Fire Departments for their assistance in getting this day together. They help with the traffic control and the parking, as well as bringing their trucks here to join us. Um, to Joanne Martin, who will be serving the cake in a little while, uh, Joanne is one of those that, if we had a long fire, you could always stand on her and her husband stand to show up with coffee and fresh donuts right out of the pot and sandwiches. So we always had something to eat with these long night fires. I'd also like to thank Jim Douglas, Bernie Sanders, Bill Doyle, and Jane Vansel for coming. I appreciate you taking part in this. Um, Patrick Ray, he couldn't make it today, but he sent us a flag with the stolen over our nation's capital. So we will have that in the fire department. Um, I'd like to thank the Christ Covenant Church for the, uh, they're doing the food for us today. I greatly appreciate that. Very nice. Um, the State Arson Union is here for, uh, with their truck to show people if you're interested to see that. Our trucks, as they have been, will be open for anyone who has questions or wants to look at them. We've got people around there to answer your questions. 
Um, the other thing that may not too many of you know is somewhere between two and four, and we can't nail them down too tight, Barrett will be landing in the ball field. We're going to fly in. We'll be here for a few minutes. Um, the next part of this, Tim, Daryl, could you come up, please? I was the youngest member on this department. And I had 20 years in at that time. The dedication to a volunteer organization is probably the most noble gesture I think anyone should make. And these two men have dedicated the last 20 years to this department. Their experience, drive, and helped to make this department a good one and one you really want to be part of. Today, in today's world, it's hard to dedicate the kind of time that it takes to be a volunteer. And with the requirements of work and family, it makes it all that much harder. These two gentlemen have found time and energy to dedicate 20 years to this department. Their experience, dedication has made this department a pleasure to be on. And with that, let me go get one. This is for Tim Morris. Doc Reeves presented to Timothy Morris in appreciation of 20 years of dedicated service to the National Volunteer Fire Department in the year 2009. Tim is my assistant chief, and through his experience in, as a radio specialist, we have communications capability to not only take us to all the departments in the area, but the state police, the Forest Service, and the Space Shuttle. It's a great, great pleasure that I give you this token of our appreciation. <laughs> this is the Daryl Burkhall and appreciation 20 years of service to the Marshall Volunteer Fire Department. It might be noted that I have a motto. So do as I say, not as I do. And Daryl is my safety officer. It's his job to make sure that I try to follow what I should be doing and not always running off in the buildings where I shouldn't be just to check things out and make sure that everybody else is safe. He stays outside and makes sure that I make it out alive. Daryl, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. The next portion is an attempt to talk about the history. Um, and the way that we We've all sat around the firehouse, taking the good, talking to the good fire stop, so the ones that were just not going out of the water. But who were these people who kept on working to make things better, get more trained, to serve the people of Marshfield? That was the first one we had in mind. So today, we'll find a list as best we can find of the men and women who served on the Marshfield Fire Service. Back back there. We've also been working side by side with other towns, particularly Plainfield and Cabot, so that those who served their departments, we couldn't do what we did. We did a Tim Cavlin, Fred Bauer, and many others who have worked hand in glove over with us for many years. The disclaimer here is that we haven't found it all, or at least all that is to be found. So, what we talk about here is a small part of what we know. In other words, it is one way to put 100 years into 25 minutes. In some ways, the story here is as ordinary as any town, but it happened to us, the people in Marshu. I was fought with whatever was around by whomever you could grab. There the fire in 1878 when the Methodist Church burned. In 1893, the harness shot by Emory Benton's was kept from burning by hanging wet carpets between the buildings. That same year, the Wheeler Hotel on the corner of Main Street and Depot Street, the road hotel livery on the other side of the Main Street burning. In 1905, the fire started in the Meter Hotel, then to the L. B. Adams Block, the Congregational Church, across the street to the Carbon Block, then to the house of Mrs. Louisa Stinson, and also to the Bancroft Block. Quoting from the paper, a large force of volunteer firefighters and village received hand. 
Babbitt responded in an unusually short space of time with a hand pump and 43 men. They've been saving us ever since then. The Mapu delegation consisted of nearly 200 men and made the run of 17 miles with F.H. Smith at the throttle in 24 minutes. The company turned on a stream of water exactly at midnight. Two streams of water played on the two hand pumpers, kept the nearby buildings well wet down, and saved them from igniting from the heat. The roofs of the houses were covered with bucket brigades that continually kept the roofs well soaked with water. Only a thousand people from nearby towns were in place during the night to lend assistance to the unfortunate, not till 4 a.m. did any of the men look at the pumps, give up, and go to their homes. The town was without fire apparatus, and the room was equipped this afternoon to buy proper equipment for a department. No, well, this didn't happen right away. 1909, the fire started in the Beckley Building, then to the Knights of Pythias, Block, and damaged the Universalist Church. This is where James Rolfe scaled the spire with the aid of a ladder, and by, by cutting through the roof of the steeple, got to the fire, and after an hour's work, extinguished the fire and saved the steeple and the church. And a picture of some of the articles back in there. So one of the residents of Marshall Duvan, summer 1st, 1909. A special meeting warning it read, Does it know how much the town will appropriate for the purpose of buying a fire engine, hose, and provide the place to keep the same men? December 16th, 1909, they voted to appropriate $500 to buy that fire engine and hose cart. The hose cart, purchased in 1910, is sitting right over there. The hand pumper and leather buckets were sold in the late 50s. The Sanborn Insurance map of 1914 shows a building located at 261 Main Street, by the fire department with hand engine, hose cart, and 800 feet of two and a half inch hose. Arch Cole's law noted, on December 5, 1911, Harry Martin's barn firm was the first use of Marshfield's engine. It made the five-mile trip in 58 minutes. Marshfield had a fire hospital at one point. On October 23, 1923, Mr. and Mrs. A.W.B. Lake had a son, six, six, six pounds, born at Crescent Hospital on the hill back of near store. In June 1926, the water ran through the new pen stock, pen stock of the new powerhouse at the foot of Molly's Pond. But in August of 1931, the dynamo burned with a loss of $80,000. January 1932, a barn at St. Spencer's barn burned. Three horses were lost. A lantern had tipped over. I guess you probably wasn't the only place that kind of thing happens. George Lindell's property in Route 215 has had a couple barns on it. In 1934, it was known as the Newt Place. Rose Pitkin went, but a younger Ronald and Belmont were not allowed to go. Then put quilts on the housework and poured water on it. In 1934, the Martin Mill burn, requiring the help of the town of Benfield Fire Engine and the Dairy Fire Department, the cost of $33.33. 33 1935, the village of Plainfield came to three fires, which paid $70. In 36, there was a fire at the Marshall Garage. The Cabot Fire Company was paid $75, and the village of Plainfield was paid $125 for that and the new one fire. October 36, Walter Barnett's Garage, the old man between hotel and livery stables, burned at 3 a.m. Cabot Plainfield engines saved the village. So what we found was while a hand pop was good, an engine wanted to be much better. Daniel Meeting at March 1937, Article 14, voted $6,000 for fire equipment in place to keep sane. Arch Cole noted, the new fire engine arrived July 17, 1937. We described it as a beauty, and of course, it's also over there. It looks like we had a problem with the engine. Lauren's garage was paid $2.60 labor on the engine. Ralph Mears had to make a call to Boston for about $65, and the American McLaren's Homemade Company Send us a timing pump, $43.25. <laughs> 1944, there are many places that have names attached to them. Some of them are just previous owners, but some of them have more significance than just that. On Bent Road, there's a place called Mary Antlix. The one time, Mary Spooner lived there, and now the Everhart's on it. When it's on the floor, the Everhart's noticed the bird ring on the floor. It seems that a woman was looking there around the woodstone maybe loaded it for the night, then caught her nightgown on fire. 
She was living with her time, at the time, took her out, rolled her in the snow, but she died of her injuries. Her name is Marianne Goodell. 1949, while Timmy One, as it's now known, is, was a tremendous asset, it was still an open cab truck. Long Gilman drove it to the Orton Barn Fire after putting a coat on the radiator to keep it warm in the 30 below temperatures. When he got there, he was so cold he couldn't move, so they had to be lifted out of the cab and set someplace warm. February 61, the fire started at the noodle garage of Newton Lee when he was cycling gas in the station wagon. The drop cord was degree to ignite the blaze. He threw the can at the door and his exit now blocked by a wall of flames. After two attempts, the barge through the garage door and he finally made his escape. The fire then spread through the eight-room, seven-year-old house. Next door, George Davis's garage flared like a torch and he went straight to the attic of his home, leaving only a shell of a hundred-year-old landmark. William Chadwick's apartment building and Don Grail's home were damaged. Fire Chief Theodore Clark of Marshall, George Beat the plane field, and Ralph Perry of Cabot joined forces to fight that fire. They were hampered by freezing white weather, this department chopped sizable hunks of ice from the Lucy. Those in hoses were a constant menace as the water would dwindle, dwindle to a trickle at times. So in February in 61, also, about 30 voters and several interested people met at the fire station discussed the need to start an arrangement for a large and more active fire department. After considerable discussion, the following officers were elected. Juan Gilman, President. Vice President, Walter Schooner. Secretary Ray Gilman. The treasurer, Cap Hayward. The next meeting was held on Sunday, the 5th at 8 p.m. Afterwards, all hands helped roll the hose and reload the fire truck, leaving the news for the recent pre alarm fire. The town report in 63 said there was $1,000 in the fire engine fund, and reported how the $500 they had was spent. 200 feet of two and a half, or inch and a half, two novels, and most importantly, a chief's helmet. In November of 63, Ronald Pitkin moved and purchased six pairs of rubber gloves to carry the fire truck for hosemen in handling flat hose. The committee reported that the hose had been removed and reloaded in the truck and that no mouse damage had been noted. That wasn't always the case. April 64, a new contract, a contract on the new truck had been signed with Walker Motors finishing the Ford 850 with a big motor and the Maxim Fire of Massachusetts supply the body of the truck. We were always concerned with mutual aid, so in 65, Article 12, you see at the time it authorized Marshall Law and the Fire Department by its chief to enter into agreements with other duly authorized fire departments that seemed appropriate to provide mutual aid protection on a systematic basis. The new truck arrived in February of 65 with $18,000, and for those who are interested, it was a Maxim Motor Company. X100 on an 857 chassis with a model 2LD 10-4 pump at an 11 foot 8 inch lift at a 5 inch suction we got a 1,008 gallons out of it at 72 pounds of pressure and at a 15 6 lift we had 656 gallons at 52 pounds pressure. Most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't understand this though. There was a fellow by the name of Benjamin Allen Sauls, married Shirley Rose Ennis on April 10th of that year. 65 months of remodeling of the firehouse, adding a, a bath, a new furnace, a wider doors, and a mutual aid agreement was signed with the Plainfield Village Fire Department. In 66, the subject of better communications been discussed for years, and a telephone type system seemed to be the best. The new telephone warning system, known as the red phone system, were installed. Those who just had the phones were Clark's Garage, Charlie Victor, Ronald Pitkin, Carl Leiter, the Junelles, Tom McClay. The phones had also included a siren button with Ted Clark, Ray Domi, Carl Hayward, and Mark Mears. That system was in place at various homes, including for a while at the post office, until Rutgers Communications known as Central began taking the calls to learn that's in the 1990s. Plainfield began using Central in 1978. In 67, we purchased a radio to be able to talk to Plainfield bearing Mount Clear, and we signed mutual agreements with Cabot in the fall of 67. 1968 noted the absence, facial absence, and illness of Chief Ted Clark. 
We do a special recognition of the Chief Clark for the outstanding public service and volunteer to the public during his many years as every office. We wish him well and say thanks. He died in March of 1969. February 16th, Cabinet Emergency Services Newsletter. The Cabinet Emergency Services was incorporated in February 1967 with the 19 emergency trips with 22 people transferred to the towns in the towns of Marshfield, Cabot, and Walden. Consisting of heart attack, stroke, accident, childbirth, concussion, and fracture of limbs. Also noted that Mr. Richard Houghton of Marshfield donated the 1956 Cadillac ambulance. 1969, Pat Hayward became chief. He named Lyle Pickton and Ray Gomez assistants, Ron Gilman and Robert Carlson as captains. 1970, found Ray Gomez as first assistant and John Schmidt as second assistant. Mutually, he was Belmont Pitkin, who was the main rider of H-300, creating mutual aid fire districts, where Capital Fire Mutual Aid had its start. Capital Fire Mutual Aid was created in September of 70. Barrytown, Marshfield, Warren were the original town signers, as well as private apartments in Berlin, East Montclair, Goddard, and Middlesex. 27 towns eventually signed on. Because of it, we can call in any of those towns, and they'll come running. No charge to us. 72, the fire department will be the backbone of the civil defense. Marion Ennis is the acting chair. In October, we are called to Hyde Park for mutual aid. June of 72, a special meeting called Civil Defense, Flood Potential Dam Break. We set up a system to monitor the Marshall Reservoir, set up firefighting procedures, routes available for fire apparatus to travel. The fire siren will only be used to time to warn a flood. Men slept in the firehouse during the night while hourly trips were made to the dam. The greater was moved with more stimulants. Part two was no good. People here washed out in the lower road at the Y. Probably didn't get a truck through. The road all gone below Fred Jewett's place. Maintain a flood watch and radio watch until July 1st at 10 in the morning. The flood work that year amounted to $20,000. We had the tanker delivered in September and half wanted to resign as chief. And December 26th, there was a fire in the toilet on Diet Road. <laughs> so I'll just hear from my golf folks. <laughs> 1974, Ronald Chief becomes chief. Ronald Pippen becomes chief. And in 75, he states that one of the department's goals is to equip each fireman with a helmet, coat, and boots to protect him from injury and keep him dry. Seems pretty standard to us now, but. We had to work hard even with that. November 11th, we throw smoke on Hollister Hill. Wine was being spread. <laughs> 1977, we saw Marshall's only fatal house fire. Two-year-old Chad Martell died after learning his mother with a fire downstairs. The back of the electric stove sparked and caught the paneling on fire. His mother grabbed the baby, but Chad didn't follow her down the stairs. They ran down the street to tell Sherwin to play. He was alerted by every, alerted everyone by the red phone in the house. Ron Pitkin was got the call at Goddard knew this was something bad. On arrival, he made a quick trip up the stairs to find Chad, but was unable to do so and had to retreat due to smoke conditions. First fire on fires unseen quickly packed up in the SCBAs and found Chad and transported to CVH. It fails in this evening. We had a radio base station in and electronic sirens stolen from the firehouse and the trucks. In August, the new state fire marshal was George Patch, who was designed, and they designated a special investigator for each barracks. That way I'm standing right back there, as a matter of fact. <laughs> May 1st, there was a 35 acre bush fire, so I'm going to be through the Crown Fire, or the 50 personnel working on the fire. The Crown Fire is one of those where the fire just goes across the top of the trees. It's a little interesting to watch, and that's much fun to be in. We also know the passing of Ron Gilman, Mike Hayward, and Raymond Houghton. Suddenly, we discovered he had anything to do with the job. September 1st, auto accident village. Danny White was pinned under a car, being, being on his chest. Half Hayward grabbed his forklift, went up, raised the car, and was slid in. Suddenly, the ancient pick and realized the department was operating as more of a department of the town or of an independent organization, but had never done so legally. So that little bit of paperwork was taken care of at the meeting in March of 79. 
The biggest benefit to us was that we were not eligible for a death benefit. Dwight Baker became the administrative assistant and Tom McClure the secretary. You know, stop the nose that without Tom and the other secretaries from the 60s on, we would know hardly any of this information. 1980, need to the pump had been rebuilt, and the chief needs a new coat. All water sources are low or non-existent. 1981, if anyone pays any attention to the fire department financial section, there's a fund called the Eddie Duke Memorial Fund. It's where any donations to the Department of Books. Who is Eddie Duke? I think the town reported in 1981, and Chief Hickman's words say it the best. Members of the Marshfield Fire Department were saddened by the death of the assistant chief, Edward Duke, a 20-year veteran. The Duke was an outstanding firefighter with great skill and commitment, who in his quiet, unassuming manner set a fine example for the rest of the force. His cool, deliberate actions, which have saved other firefighters from injury, assisted in the dangerous recovery of a victim of fire, assisted in the saving of life of a fellow worker that can only be described fellow brave and heroic. The more we just received his honor will enhance the life protection capabilities of the department in keeping with his care of others. His widow Skip lives here in the village. She later married Henry Bayshaw, former Cabot Fire Chief and Marshall Firefighter until his death in 1997. Firefighters over the years attended state schools. At this time, it was 45 hours. It is now 190. Hmm? Okay. Guess what? They just get getting more interesting. Another news of that year, the minutes report that 10 W runs the weeks. And so does the firehouse work right over Don Marsh's head. 1984 began a new era for us. The fire chief report states that the firehouse is no longer adequate. A new building needs to be considered. To get anything on top of the engine or tanker, these had to be driven out of the station and onto Route 2. She followed Pitkin notes the resignation of a 22 year veteran, Charlie Bickford, and his wife Barbara here into the Redcoats. Mike Pitkin announced his own resignation. He notes, in the nine years I have had the pleasure of serving, we have responded to 542 calls, an average of 60 a year. Day or night, there never seems to be a grumble for anyone to respond, and their reputation as a firefighting team is hard to beat. Johnny Schmidt was elected fire chief in the coming year and remained through 1988. And Ronald Pittman received the title of Lieutenant. It seems when you teach a fire school in Central America, if you're not an officer, they won't listen to you. So we figured that a former fire chief would qualify for a lieutenant's position. 1985 mentions that while the firehouse situation is getting any better, neither is the comfort. It's been around for 22 years. 1986, Cabernet Spa is the jaws of life. We also know in 86, Bryce Pitkin passing away in May. He was a five year old, he watched the 1905 fire with Isaiah Pitkin. 1987, we have pictures of Johnny doing some site work on the new firehouse rock. And the selectmen of that year have bought the rear lock for the fire station. 88, the fire chief's report notes that the new firehouse is progressing nicely. Kevin Rand got the bid to erect the structure and the home purchases the flyers. It also noted that the fire truck needs to be replaced soon. Also, that John and Jean Burnett, owners of the Marshfield Village store, have donated $1,398 from the sale of Ben & Jerry's Seconds ice cream. They did this for many years. Jean's out here someplace. There she is. 1989, Dwight Baker took over as chief, temporary assignments of John Schmidt as first assistant, and Ben Salls as second. We moved into the new fire station on, one, on August 26th. Ben Salls took the first truck out of the new station on August 30th. A tree had dropped on the power line causing a grass fire at the current location of the Goodrich Sugar House. I have to the first fire, too. Sergeant Tim Bombardier was in the University. I was an investigator for our area. When I joined in 1989, the way you got to the fire, got a fire department was to call the phone number and up to 10 phones would answer and listen to your call. Those red phones, to be exact, these people would take your information and then call up the firemen by a fan-out list. You'll see a couple of those fan-out lists on the back table. So I did 
That was the names, the women who answered the phones and made those calls for years. In 1990, John Schmidt said Lorelei, Rob Bain said Betty, Hayward residents, Tippy. The kick then said Ellen, Billy Shiles took the call and then hit the door running. Mary Baker often had my number on her list, and my wife would answer while I tried to get to the fire and maybe be joyous. Tom had surely taken calls and occasional neighbor running to call. Joe House the South Fire. During Chief Pittman's time, his only question was, who would get to the pumper first? Johnny, Dwight, or Ben? Yeah. February, structure fire, when there's a throw a cigarette, then to a box of sawdust the night before. The uh, structure fire probably got me. The snow smoke got good eye up. He saw fire on the arm of the couch next to the telephone. BSP Sergeant Perkins and Hatch. The dispatch to investigate. 91 August 4th, Whiteman took the first press state of his arm. December 19th, a structure fire got in college. The pottery cabinet a lighted rock and put into the drive into the cabinet to dry the pottery. The sprinkler system put it out. December 28th, smoke showing from the steeple of the Macedonia Baptist Church. Which of smoke is going from the chimney toward the steeple, and why the steeple made it seem like the smoke was coming from the steeple itself? Saw that person, and yeah, you can see that the steeple was on fire. In 1992, the fire department budget was $28,915. We gave Cabot Ambulance $800, and the new thing for the fast squad, we gave $500. They put 15 in R1 into service in July of 1992. January 16th of that year, was well, from Maple Hill, snow ashes put outside in a paper bag in a woodshed attached to the house. <laughs> On the other hand, in July uh, 25th, the Cabot Road residents looked over and saw large shower sparks on Sid Rogers' roof. It was the moths, etc., in the southern vapor light across from the firehouse. <laughs> 93 Chief Dwight Baker, first assistant Tim McClay, and assistant chief, chief was Chip Deasy. Chip he got the plan to uh, teach him truck today. Under the column of why some people do or should join the fire department. November 2nd, November 28th. W. Swords residents. Homeowner dumped ashes on the ground, but the wind spread falls to a nearby pile and ignited it, and neighbors called in the fire. 1994, Randy Sicily and Richard Dufresne were working with the local schools on fire education. In 1995, we established 911 column for the 426 exchange. Our some training we got from Sergeant Harrington. Fire Department license and sell the radio repeater, primarily to coordinate fire activities in each way that allowed the town to, to communicate throughout the town. September 30th to October 2nd. There were some boys dropped off in the Navy Sugar Campground and they were intending to ride around Kettle Pond, Kitchen Pond, and then off to Plainfield. We spent two nights while searchers, they spent two nights out while searchers spent Saturday night, all day Sunday, and most of Sunday night searching for them. They spent a second night in Kitchen Pond Bog. They walked out to the Nature Center Monday morning and used a Florida cell phone to call home about 11 in the morning. 1996, 20 years of service clocks, given to Dwight Baker, Henry Bashaw, Bill Hayward, Phil Brown, Tom McClay, Tom McClay, Don Marsh, Ronald Pipkin, and Danny Schmidt, and Lord Springer. And Tom McClay became the new fire chief. How many people have walked up this mountain? How fast? 45 minutes? 60? About 36. Of course, the government helps when you've got a patient at the top of that mountain who thought he could fly and jumped out of the fire tower. Matt Martin. It took three departments and three hours to carry him down to load him onto the dark air medical ambulance, and yes, he lived. And there's a video report on that back there. Took the liver on your tanker in November. In 1987, we began selling dry hydrants around the area. We asked for $2,500 for a dry hydrant at the Potter's Brig on Maple Hill. 
if you don't see the job items, no refunded by state grants. Now, uh, we now have eight in the town. October 17th, ski test on Lower Depot Road with a small structure fire going. Firefighter Marsh ran around and damped it with a garden hose until we came. Pretty much it. We also note the death that year of Crestwell Tinker Collins. Thank you, Fireman, Marshall Select Board Member, and the other 1998, E911 services were eventually implemented, so we put up our new street signs and many new addresses for residents. But as we found out, the technology is only as good as the information it's given. January 26, structure fire called in. Always stated that the house is on Mac Mountain Road and they're all meeting the residents. But the 911 address said Cabot Village. Turns out that the people had just moved and kept the same phone number, and 911 had not been updated. So, the current K3, Tim Morris, thought he was first on scene, but found the former K3, Chip Deasy, now a patient firefighter, on scene without a radio. We blurred in there just like old times. We also note that year in the death of Dennis Holt in July. 2000, May 10th, the lightning struck a large pine tree behind the Linus house on Lightford Road. It went underground, turning over dirt like a two-bottom plow, went to the house, onto the satellite dish ground, through the receiver, the controller, and back off the ground wire of the regular ground wire of the house. May 22nd, news accident by the Marsh County Motel. VSP called us. Seems it was a bit slippery, so the fire department had to wash down the road. It was slippery for about 200 yards. Not only was it slippery from the loose stomach, etc., etc., but the smell was more of the same. August 5th, tractor trailer, tractor and bailer drove over a farmer on Ennis Road. Skate ran scene found the patient just behind the rear wheel of the tractor. The tractor had driven itself up a tree at a 30 degree angle and still running, ready to quit and roll back down on it. The tractor stabilized, patient was moved, and the incident ended for us at least. 2001, the smoke detector went off again at Trunfield, but burned popcorn. This is a fairly regular occurrence. 2002 recognized 25 years of service with Jackets, Lark Joker, Buster Brown, Hat Hayward, Tim McClay, Tom McClay, Don Marsh, and Pipkin, Johnny Schmidt, and Murph Smoker. In front of at that time, with Tom, Ronald, and Buster had more than 40 years of service. In August, there was a possible forest fire on Gola Mountain at 05100. In 05100, K1 was in route, 15 K1 was in route, three minutes later, as we're all responding to power callbacks, says, no, it's just the moon rising. <laughs> that year, Cabot Henry of Cabot Creamery assisted Marshall, Plainfield, and Cabot Fire in purchasing the first thermal imaging camera. 2003, we received many grants over the those two years. In that two years, we received over $57,000 from the radios. The CBA extracted equipment portable home. And I think we've come to nearly 100,000 over the years of grants that the uh, state and federal have been able to acquire for equipment for the fire department. 84, excuse me, in 2004, Cabot and North have the very time for the medical capabilities of their calls, and we know the death of Philmont 15. 2005, the fire department becomes a full-fledged communication center, including the radios to talk to state police, emergency management, fish and game, forest and parks, emergency amateur radios, and the health network. We also obtained the emergency generator to keep power at the fire station, commercial, commercial power fails, a sprinkler system, and a fire alarm system installed. Additional weather stations now recording and reporting for winds and tents and rainfall. The more weather radio can call us to check on the conditions in Marshfield, since the radar doesn't reach them. There down here. 2006, the fire chief in McClay. October, we headed out to a smoke alarm activation in Holt Road. While en route, the homeowner called to report a cat had turned on the toaster and sat out of the smoke. <laughs> K1 was not so sure. He investigated, found the report to be true. 
Then we also know the death of Buster Brown, Frederick Fowler, Lois Gilman, and Lucille Lightfoot. November 5th of 01001. Tower of the bank. The operator called on a cell phone and using the cell location of the towers, they put the car on May Smith Brook Road. After driving by several times, they finally found the car down 40 feet in, over the bank. And we did occasionally create our own call. October 25th, fire alarm activation at the March 3rd Fire Department. Low water pressure to open the water to the sprinkler system, but at least no heads went off. There are all sorts of things to see and talk about. I've been down March right through the floor of the burning building and from the floor yanked him back up and out again. One of the more recent successes was the old wine out place on Beaver Meadow Road. The fire was stopped at the room of origin by about 30 seconds. The Grinnell House is a place we visited before. Years ago, there was a chimney fire. And upon going upstairs to investigate the chimney fire, they found a box of leaking dynamite next to the chimney. They just carried it. To continue reading all of this, doesn't bring back emotions in these tough old men and some of the younger folks who look laughter and sadness will be alive. You love remembering some of them and some of them you'd rather not. Too close, too hard to do that. What we have in the back there is the raw data as we've assembled information for the last hundred years. If you'd like any more pictures and information you have, come back and take a look at what we've got so far. And as always, we thank you for your support. That's how we do what we do. <laughs> We'd like to end the service today, the ceremony, with what's called the Five Bell Ceremony. And I'll read a little about it. It's a historic thing the fire departments have done for years. The fire service today is ever changing but steeped in tradition of 200 years. One such tradition is the sound of the bell. In the past, as firefighters have begun their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of that day's shift. Throughout the day and night, each alarm sounded by a bell. When the fire was out, the alarm would come to an end. It was the bell that signaled for the completion of that call. When a firefighter died in the line of duty, paying the ultimate sacrifice, it was the mournful toll of the bell to solemnly announced the primary passing. The signal of five bells, repeated four times, was the signal that alerted the fire department the death of a member killed in the line of duty or a member who died while serving the armed forces. We ring these bells now to remember those who have given their lives in service of this country. The first set of five will be run by Murph Spooner, former Marshall Fire Department member at the Congregational Church Steeple. The second, a Deputy Chief Tom McClay at his 1917 White. The third set, by former Chief Ron Pickton and Marshall's 1937 Pumper. And the fourth, by Chief McClay. The ceremony will end today the playing of amazing grace.
Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for coming. Uh, we will be having some live music now. Benny Pirates will be playing for a bit, and then we'll move into here. The schedule is kind of posted over there. And uh, there's lots of history to take a look at back there. And uh, firemen love showing off their fire trucks. Enjoy the day. This is yellow over here. Chocolate if you want.